Okay, uh, welcome everyone to today's seminar. Uh, my name is Nancy Holm, and I'm the assistant director here at ISDC and the seminar organizer along with Beth uh, Mischewski. Uh, this is the second to the last of our seminars for the fall. Uh, the last one will be December 3rd, uh, which will be on Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy by Dr. Mark David of the university here. Um, for those uh, who are listening um, and cannot attend uh, the seminars in person, as you know, we broadcast the seminars live, and they're also recorded and archived on our website. It usually takes about four or five days for the video to be posted after the presentation date. Um, as we begin the seminar here today, uh, I would ask everyone um, in attendance to please silence your cell phones. And then also we'll hold all the questions to the end, and I'll come around with the microphone uh, if you do have a question for the speaker. For those uh, viewing online, you can type your questions in at any time, and we'll answer those at the end also. So I'm very pleased today to introduce our speaker, Aslin uh, Goucher, who is the manager of the Great Lakes Sustainability Program at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. Aslin uh, began her career at the Shed in the development department as a coordinator of donor relations. The transition to conservation began when she became the co-trip leader of the Shed Aquarium's Iguana Research Expedition in the Bahamas in 2011 and 2012. Before coming to the Shed, uh, Aslin uh, was a member of the New York University's archaeological excavation team in Egypt. Uh, she graduated with honors from Illinois Wesleyan University with a BA in Greek and Roman studies, so she has a very wide range of interests. We're very pleased today to have her talking via webinar uh, discussing sustainability at the Shedd Aquarium. I'll turn it to you, over to you then, uh, Asla. Thank you so much, Nancy, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm absolutely thrilled to be joining you today from a, albeit chilly but sunny, Chicago. It's, uh, I think finally the weather is catching up to us, but all is well. So I'm here today to share a little bit about um, one of my favorite topics, uh, as you can imagine, working in sustainability. It's sustainability and water conservation here at SHED. SHED, as you can imagine, has a very interesting and exciting challenge ahead of us as an aquarium when it comes to water conservation. And that's primarily because, as you can tell if you've ever visited, water is kind of how we do things. It's, it provides the home for our animals. It sustains um, you know, a large group of staff and volunteers, and it also makes this a really positive experience for our guests. So water is integral to what we do. And in my mind, it's also kind of how we walk the talk as good stewards of the environment, good stewards of our animals and our guests, and how we pave the way for a sustainable future moving forward. So today, I'm very excited to share with you a little bit about three specific areas of the work that I oversee here at SHED. The first is our Great Lakes Stewardship Program. So this is the, in my mind, the how do we walk the talk in the community about water conservation. Um, share a little bit more about water conservation at SHED and the recent successes that we've had. And then also talk a little bit about you know, how you can help conserve our world's waters, both fresh and, and marine, by choosing sustainable seafood, because it really makes a big difference as well. And I'm very excited to share with you today. Bear with me. We have some fun, quirky images coming up. So feel free to have a chuckle alongside me. So why is stewardship in the Great Lakes important to Shedd Aquarium? Well, we see it as, again, walking the talk. You know, we, we are very lucky to be situated directly on the shores of Lake Michigan here. I'm looking out as, at uh, our wonderful Great Lake as we speak. And these Great Lakes, are a truly globally unique resource. They provide the home to 36 million people, 3,500 plant and animal species called the Great Lakes home, and they contain 20% of global surface freshwater and 90% of the surface freshwater from the United States. That's a staggering resource when you think about it. And you know, this is a one-time gift from glaciation. These are not you know, continually renewed with the exception of precipitation, et cetera. And so for us, it's just so critically important to ensure the future of the Great Lakes ecosystem and the animals that call it home, but it's also critical to human health moving forward. So how do we do that? Again, I mentioned we have a responsibility to protect, and that's really for future generations. So the challenge is, as an aquarium, you know, how do we, how do we make that difference? How do we get out into our own backyard and help you know, preserve a future that everyone can enjoy? 
A really fun way that we do that, and some of you may be familiar with this program, is called Great Lakes Action Days, or affectionately known here forth as GLADS. They make me glad, so why not call them GLADS? Um, so this is a program that's very fun. We basically work with organizations all throughout Chicagoland, community groups, schools, um, basically anyone who's interested in coming out and volunteering, including corporate partners, et cetera. And we basically get them out into the muck. We put on boots, we put on gloves, and we get work done. So we partnered with six sites all throughout the southern shore of Lake Michigan here, from Illinois Beach State Park in the north, all the way down to Indiana Dudes National Lakeshore in Indiana. And we work with these sites to help um, conserve and protect the incredible natural resources that are there. And this activity is really fun, and like I said, it can be very dynamic. Folks who participate in GLADS can do everything from helping to pull invasives that are a significant um, problem throughout all of these sites. They can participate in water quality monitoring initiatives. We have been working with these GLAD partners now for three years and are trying to accrue enough water quality data to be able to help inform management based on outfalls or specific things that are going on in those um, particular partner sites. We also help plant native plants where possible, collect seeds to help ensure that the native um, flora is thriving in these areas as well. And we also have the opportunity to get people out and help understand a little bit of the aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems around them and the fauna in involved. So we're also doing active fish surveying to help identify what's living in these areas and how all of this comes together to form a picture of land management for these really exciting and unique sites. What's fun about this program as well is that if any of you have grown up in Chicago or visited Chicago, it's hard when you're right downtown to really appreciate how close these wild places and wild animals are. You know, if you grew up in the city, it's probably not something that was top of mind for you unless you lived in a very special household, that there are forest preserves and really incredible wild spaces mere miles and minutes away from your home. So part of the fun of this program is getting some of these inner city audiences especially the school groups and the after-school programs that we work with, out into the resources that are so close. You know, many times we work with students who, although they've grown up in Chicago, have never been to the lakefront. They've never been to Lake Michigan, and they certainly have never engaged with natural resources like this in a very active and deliberate way to help preserve and protect them. And it's a very transformative and fun experience. A new program that we recently launched this year, a little bit of spoiler for you, we're also working with the forest preserves of Cook County to help um, restore and protect some critical amphibian habitat. As many of you may know, SHED recently launched a new special exhibit dedicated to amphibians. It's you can see it. And so it was very important to us that we took our stewardship mission that was a part of our Great Lakes Action Day program and extended that to help conserve and protect critical habitat for these very special skin breathers that share, um, that share our natural resources. So that work involves oftentimes controlling buckthorn, which many of you may know is, is, is a very problematic invasive for many reasons, but also because it's toxic to, it excretes a toxin that's really damaging to amphibians. So we're working to control buckthorn, we're working to help sort of understand what the water quality parameters are that best suit amphibians and really just help ensure that the upstream impacts or the upstream um, flora that's, that's, that's in these areas is as healthy as possible to help support amphibians. Another cool part of this work that's been ongoing um, is mud puppy research that's being done by an incredible um, associate that works with SHED and SIU, Carbondale, to, um, to identify where these really interesting native salamander, the mud puppy, um, is located. A lot of that work is being done in Wolf Lake right now. And as a part of the Great Lakes Action Day program, we get volunteers out to help contribute to that research, which is brand new and very exciting. So I've mentioned that it's a very exciting program, that it's this kind of transformative experience that we're offering to really get boots on the ground and help conserve and protect our natural resources in Shed's backyard. But Great Lakes Action Days do more than just have an inspirational or aspirational goal. They, they really are making an impact. And in 2015 alone, obviously we still have our December work days to go, we've had 1,961 volunteers come out and work with us. They've spent 4,875 hours in the field, and this is hard work. We've removed 3,544 plus pounds of debris from our beaches, which include you know, just over 1,000 pounds of 
recyclables and over 2,000 pounds of trash, which is, as you can imagine, quite a lot um, coming off of our area beaches. And we've also removed 2,600 gallons of invasive plants. And the reason that's in gallons is we typically um, sequester them in 10-gallon bags. So don't worry, we know that that's not a liquid measurement. <laughs> um, and we've also helped to plant 6,200 native plants. So these numbers really just demonstrate that you know, our commitment to ensuring that our natural resources in the Great Lakes are preserved and protected for future generations really does make a difference to this program. And SHED will continue to care for our backyard through community action. So that takes me to the water conservation story at Shed Aquarium itself. And I, I affectionately like to call this the 49% reduction story. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we dive in. But as I mentioned at the beginning of, of my talk, you know, Shed really cares about water. You know, both the health of our 32,000 animals and operations as a world-class cultural institution depend on water. It's a key focus area for the conservation and sustainability initiatives that I help oversee. And with 2 million guests annually and over 200, or sorry, 20,000 member households and annual media impressions in the tens of thousands, et cetera, you know, SHED really has lead the way when it comes to sustainability, especially water conservation in the zoo and aquarium community. So sustainability at SHED. So the sustainability programs at SHED extend far in far deeper and far more diverse ways than just water. We have a sustainability strategic plan here that I'll talk a little bit more about that truly helps set the goal and the vision for the aquarium from you know, everything with animal diets to water conservation, to our purchasing, to animal hospital, et cetera, et cetera. So we really have a diverse uh, platform that we like to, to consider when we talk about sustainability. And we really think that sustainability is one of the most important things that we do here. It's good for the animals in our care. It helps reflect Shed's conservation mission, which is absolutely critical to who we are and what we do. It's good for business. As you all know, a lot of times sustainable operations can really be good in terms of ROI and help really support an effective, efficient business model. And it helps keep Shed to the forefront of our industry. Again, we have unique challenges as zoo and aquariums in that we have the, the health and well-being of animals is our number one charge, and then we need to operate efficiently in sustainability as well, and sustainably as well. So it's, it's a unique challenge for us. And that unique challenge really spurs innovation for the, for the creative and critical minds here at SHED to make sure that we're doing things as best as we can in unique and exciting ways, because you have to get creative a lot of times. So this goal of getting to 49% water reduction, this is kind of how we did it. So really, at the end of the day, this comes down to SHED was committed to, as an aquarium, as a conservation organization, significantly reducing our water usage. And again, that's a big challenge because we are all about water. Our animals rely on water for their habitats. People need water to drink. We rely on water as a part of our operations as a building. And so we really said, you know, if we're going to hit a sustainability target, let, let it be water because it's going to be our greatest challenge. And indeed, it has been a significant challenge. It's also been a very exciting initiative here at SHED. So the way that we went about this is in 2009, we underwent a audit at SHED to understand exactly where our water was being used and to identify, honestly, some areas for significant improvement. And that, wa that, that water audit, which I will go into a little bit more detail in the next slide, identified our cooling systems, water and the building itself, as the biggest consumers of water, which is very interesting. So it was from this original audit that SHED came together and established that sustainability strategic plan that I just mentioned a few moments ago. And that was where the goal of 50% reduction in water by 2018 was established. We thought, man, that's, that's going to be a very big big milestone to hit, and it's going to be a significant challenge in doing so. And this water audit in 2009 um, helped us identify sort of the key areas that we were going to focus on. And we used a baseline of roughly 57,919,136 gallons uh, that, we do, with, that we used in line for creating that 50% water reduction. So here is what that water audit in 2009 told us. It told us basically that 
cooling our water and our um, mechanical operations here at SHED was responsible for 38% of our overall water use, which is incredibly significant. And it honestly debunked an assumption that a lot of us had here at SHED. We thought that our animal systems, because the animal habitats are the most forefront in our minds when it comes to water, were going to be the most excessive users. And that was actually not the case, although they came in second, certainly. And then down, down the, the chain here, our plumbing fixtures were 12%, leaks and losses 9%. As you can imagine, we're a very large and old building, and a lot of times there are some areas that where water is traveling that we just didn't know. So we can, leaks and losses were certainly part of the picture. Irrigation and food service, 4%, and mechanical systems, 15%. So this helped us, again, really be able to scrutinize our operations and identify where we were going to really target our resources to begin with and start chipping away at that 50% water reduction goal. So now I'm going to chat with you a little bit about some of the really special stories that we have around how we started to achieve some water, some significant water reduction here at SHED. So one of the first stories that I like to tell is about the chillers. So as you remember from that last slide, cooling water was a very significant user and the most significant user of water in the building. And that was because SHED's chilling system at the time was comprised of three 500-ton chillers that sat on our roof, a 1,500-ton cooling tower, and that was sort of outdated equipment. But it was responsible for cooling 460,000 square feet, excuse me, that should be feet, not food, um, of the facility here at SHED. And it was responsible also for chilling millions of gallons of water per day for the cold water animals in our ocean area and in other areas of the, of the um, of the aquarium here. So that small, small, small system had a big, big job, and it was using a whole lot of water. So one of the first things that we did, which we considered sort of low-hanging fruit but provided significant savings, was a capital project. We replaced the chillers and the cooling tower with a very high efficiency system. And this led to an immediate 3 million gallon reduction in water usage, which is enormous. This is annual water usage, and a $20,000 annual savings. So off the bat, you know, we did what a lot of folks do who engage in large-scale sustainability projects. We said, what capital projects do we need to undertake that will significantly aid in our reductions? And this was number one. So we did that, which was great. As a part of this, we also installed a closed-loop tenant condenser system to recycle water through the chillers. So essentially, instead of pumping in new water to help chill um, our different systems around here that were used in the chillers, we closed that loop, so water was just recycled in and out of those chillers to help keep our systems running smoothly. And that simple fix, again, resulted in an over 10 million gallon savings and a $70,000 annual savings when it comes to the, our financial commitments. So that was huge. It was a big, big, big difference for us here at SHED. The other thing we started doing was collecting rainwater for the cooling tower. So again, we weren't having to pull new water into this system that was using a lot of water so that we could operate efficiently. And that savings was exciting as well, 708,000 gallons and $4,600 in annual savings. So these capital projects alone and these sort of fixes that were, I would say, at the forefront of what we were trying to do provided very significant savings in a short amount of time. Then we kind of got creative. We understood that now that we had addressed one of the most significant uses of water in the building, it was time for us to look into those animal systems and really identify what was working well question assumptions around the way that we had always done things and industry standards, and identify some opportunities for us to innovate and to move forward. So one of these situations was around our lovely penguins. You see some of those charming little guys right there right now. Um, so the situation here was before we had renovated our lovely Abbott Oceanarium that many of you have perhaps have visited, uh, the, the penguin system, we had different species of penguins in that exhibit, and it was a freshwater system. And it used, on average, five gallons a minute of water, which is a significant use of water. So we took advantage of the renovation of our oceanarium and replaced that old system that was a huge water user with a closed-loop salt water system. So again, we got new species of penguins that appreciated cold salt water, and we replaced it with a system that was much more efficient, immediately saving us you know, oh, just over 2.5 million gallons and $17,000 in annual savings. So again, a simple somewhat simple. It was actually sort of complicated in terms of engineering it, but we took advantage of renovations to make sure that we could basically make our, 
our operations as sustainable as possible when it came to our animals, especially these penguins. We also looked a little bit deeper. So we said, OK, we've got new, we've got new penguins. We've got a, a brand new oceanarium that's about to open up. We, we have these reserve areas as well, which are basically behind the scenes habitats that are used for um, either getting penguins acclimated to one another, feeding them, daily care, and also for medical purposes. And there's significant you know, pools of water that are back there. We looked at those current systems during the renovation and also identified that they were using a significant amount of water. And we said, let's take advantage of this and replace them. And with those replacements, we, we replaced both the reserve and the medical pool systems. We immediately had another 1.5 million gallon savings and $10,000 annual savings. So again, questioning simple things, ensuring that we had the most efficient um, situations possible for our animals really saved us a lot of water. For some reason, this is not clicking. There we go. So another story, now moving a little bit into the warmer water area of shed, fresh water, um, was around our Amazon Rising exhibit. So this is a very cool exhibit that sort of um, helps illustrate the rise and fall of seasonal and multi-year variations in the Amazon River Basin. And so this, this exhibit had an interesting uh, challenge with it as well, in that the animals that live in the Amazon exhibit have very, very, very specific water quality standards that must be maintained to optimize their health. They're very, they're very sensitive, and that's a, that's a good thing to know from an animal care perspective. But what that meant for us is that we were doing water changes, so filtering the water out and supplying it with new fresh water very frequently. And all that sort of water that was drained out, so the, the, the water that was being replaced, was going straight to the sewer because we didn't have a system in place that was closed loop. So what we did was renovate that system itself. We replaced um, the reverse os osmosis filtration system, which again is that filtration system that ensured that, that we had the optimum water quality for those sensitive animals in this exhibit. And that simple membrane replacement and the filtration system replacement saved us 2 million gallons of water and $13,000 on an annual basis. And then we also utilized that wastewater, so the water that was getting changed out to ensure animals' optimal health, um, was used to actually backwash and clean the filters. And that simple, simple thing also saved us 579,000 gallons and $4,000 on an annual basis. This is kind of a fun story that I like to call follow that water. So SHED has, if you've visited recently, multiple levels. We have the original aquarium that's just sort of right after where you enter. We have our wild reef exhibit, which is down an elevator below um, the Stingray Touch area and our, and our terraces there. And then we also have the Abbott Oceanarium, which is down one more floor, and it's a saltwater exhibit. So we have a variety of different exhibits on multiple levels both freshwater and saltwater needs, warm water and cool water. We have a very diverse collection here and diverse needs for those animals. In the Abbott Oceanarium in specific, it's a 3 million gallon habitat out of water. And it's saltwater and it's cool water in that exhibit. And up until the most recent renovation, all of that saltwater was created on site. So we would take fresh water um, from the system, pull it up, chill it, and then add salt to be able to ensure that the, the saline balance was right for our animals. Uh, but that was a whole lot of water. Whenever that water needed to be changed for our animal's health, we'd have to pull new water in, add the salt, and put it back into that exhibit. So that 3 million gallon habitat suddenly looks like a whole lot of water use. So what we did was work with our animal care experts here at SHED to ask an interesting question. So we said, you know, I know that we, we need we know that we need to create salt water for our special animals in the in the Abbott Oceanarium. But we have other saltwater exhibits here at Shed and other exhibits here at Shed that that use a lot of water, but we we wonder if what we can do is essentially get creative with our plumbing and reroute the water from some of these exhibits into the oceanarium. Would that be okay for the animals in the oceanarium? Would that be healthy for them? Because that would save us a lot of water. So our internal teams um, and animal care experts did an investigation into this. They said, OK, well, that's a really interesting question. Let's question our assumptions around this sort of practice that we've done forever and see if we could find a way to not waste as much water as we were using. And the answer, interestingly enough, was yes. It was 
absolutely doable. We could reuse water from other exhibits and put it into the oceanarium. And as a major bonus that led to a really cool initiative that I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute, it actually provided a better, more rich, and healthy environment for the animals in the oceanarium because it provided a richer microbiome for them. And again, I'll, as I mentioned, I'll get into that a little bit. It's a little bit complicated. Um, so it was a huge win-win. And we achieved this win-win by just simply questioning the status quo. Like, could we possibly save water by rerouting it to other places? Maybe the knee-jerk reaction was, no, that's only for these animals. But by doing a little bit more digging and by being a little bit tenacious with our inquiry, we discovered that, indeed, we could reuse that water. And it would actually be better for the animals in the oceanarium than that new water, which is great. So this redirection and repurposed water ended up saving us two and a half million gallons and $16,500 on an annual basis. So a major win for both the Aquarium Sustainability Initiative and our pocketbook. So those are just a few of the really exciting stories um, and initiatives that we've undertaken over the last several years here at Shed to Save Us Water. Um, and ultimately, all of that work rolled up into this very exciting table that I have here. This is all of the savings that SHED has seen throughout the last several years that got us to a 49% reduction in our water use. So that goal, that 50% water reduction by 2018, is mostly complete, which is very, very exciting. Overall, with all of our different projects that were going on with identifying leaks and losses, with innovation, with questioning assumptions, we reduced our water usage to 29,803,606 gallons a year, which is down from, again, that 2007 baseline of 57, almost 56, or I'm sorry, almost 58 million gallons, which is absolutely huge. So it really took a creative and excited and innovative team here at SHED to make this happen. And it was definitely an aquarium-wide initiative, and I'm just very proud of all the different things that we've done to achieve these um, significant reductions. What's interesting about really important sustainability initiatives like this is that sometimes the majority of the work, so really impressive numbers that get you down to significant percentage and reduction, um, is the stuff that can be done by a select few with very inspired minds and some money to put to the project. And it's that final 1% that's the hardest and most challenging to achieve. And honestly, that's the case here at SHED. So, we have essentially done a very, very careful study into all of the different ways that our building when it comes to water. We've fixed all our leaks and losses. We've, if, we've maximized our efficiencies. We've replaced equipment. And that's gotten us to this 49%. And now the 1% um, is going to be a big struggle because it's, it's finding all of those little tiny gallon savings that are going to get us, get us to, the, to the finish line here. It's continuing to identify opportunities for improvement, of course. But more than anything, it's questioning the status quo. So each one of the staff and volunteers that work here at SHED is going to need to question how their behaviors ultimately impact our, our goals when it comes to sustainability. People are going to have to ask the question when they're washing their dishes after lunch. Am I doing this efficiently? Can I reduce my gallons? Because really, at the end of the day, every little thing counts. And with all of the 2 million annual visitors that SHED sees with our food service, with staff and volunteers, Every small behavior has a significant cumulative effect, and it's those little behaviors that we're really going to have to focus on. We're also going to need to, frankly, innovate some more. You know, we're going to need to look into all the different possibilities um, that our significant footprint holds for us and, and question. We need to push the needle. We need to, you know, constantly be striving for, you know, setting the bar rather than following the industry standard. Um, and what's interesting about that is that this last example that I shared with you about the exhibit water from other areas being routed to the oceanarium for use and it enriching the microbiome for those animals there led to a very exciting project that some of you may have known about, but it's the world's first study on essentially what a healthy microbiome looks like for animals in an aquarium and zoo setting. And a microbiome, very literally in, in, in a very high level, because I'm not a microbiologist by any means, um, but are the tiny, there's a tiny biological community that makes up air, water, surfaces, basically all the small organisms that exist around the megafauna that we're so used to, to calling an ecosystem or a community. And these microbes can be incredibly beneficial to the health of humans and animals. 
they, you know, a lot of times when you think about microbiome or microbes, we think about the bad stuff, you know, the, the stuff that makes us sick and the, and the things that we'd like to eliminate. Um, but really, that's a very short-sighted view of all the different benefits of the microbial community. And so this study that's working with Argonne National Laboratories, University of Illinois, the Illinois Institute of Technology, and the USDA is exploring the unique relationships between the countless unseen living organisms that share our exhibit environments with the animals that live there. And this study is intended to help, help us understand how these communities interact in order to maximize the health, wellness, and frankly, the efficiency of the habitats here at SHED. And that's a very interesting question. So presently, we are, under, we are underway in terms of this study. We are scrutinizing all the different microbial communities in the oceanarium and their stingray habitat, as I had just included here in this picture. And these studies that are conducted will have very significant impacts on the way that animals' um, environments are cared for in zoo and aquarium settings. But they're also going to help shed light on how the microbes and microbiomes operate in the wild, because essentially zoo and aquarium settings are just smaller facsimiles for wild for wild um, situations. So it'll be it'll be really useful in identifying sort of the, the the cutting edge of the next generation of what we understand about the way that the that the natural world works with each other. So that, in short, and again, that was a very high level overview of this project is just an example of the really innovative stuff we're going to have to do to, uh, to really find reduction. And those subtle shifts in behavior are going to be very important for us. So lastly, I'd like to share with you a little bit about ways that we can help conserve natural resources when it comes to marine ecosystems as well as freshwater um, in your home and in your communities. And this is a large part of what SHED's takeaway message is as well when it comes to conservation. And that's sustainable seafood. So you may be wondering, OK, we've just talked really technically about you know, ways that SHED's getting boots on the ground to help restore the Great Lakes. That's very clear. It's a clear action that helps conserve those resources. And we talked, uh, obviously, about our water um, conservation techniques here at SHED as well. And that's also very clear and transparent in why we're doing that and how it protects the environment. Sustainable seafood for some folks is a little bit more of a cognitive stretch. You know, people don't associate the things that they eat sometimes with conservation. And honestly, it's, it's funny to me because this is one of my absolute favorite initiatives that we have. And that's because eating sustainable seafood is one of the most direct impacts that each one of us as individuals can have on protecting and preserving the wild counterparts of the animals and sheds care. Um, in, in natural ecosystems. And that's because the most significant impact on wild fish is fishing and seafood and what humans eat. So every time you pick up your fork, you have a significant opportunity to really help support and protect sustainable fisheries worldwide. And if, if people would only understand that, we could make a very big difference to help preserve and protect those environments. So sustainable seafood at Shed similar to our um, sustainability strategic plan, applies to both the way that we do things in our home and the way that we talk to folks about how they can make an impact in their home. So at SHED here, we have a goal as a part of that sustainability strategic plan to have only 100% sustainable seafood given to our animals here at SHED. And we have achieved that goal, which is super great. And sustainable seafood here at SHED basically means best choice or good alternative seafood as defined by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program, who's a great partner of ours here at SHED. Um, and I said just a minute ago that we had reached that goal, which is super exciting. And it's true. The only caveat is there are some very specific species that our animals need that have not been assessed for sustainability. That means that these fisheries have not demanded enough of the human marketplace to warrant an assessment by Seafood Watch or another sustainability certifier. So we're working with our partners at Seafood Watch and others in Aquaria to help get those um, particular fisheries assessed to ensure that we are serving the most sustainable seafood possible to our animals. What else? What other, the other thing that's cool about this in terms of our animal care is that just like we do in our um, habitats for our animals, we are committed to providing the absolute best care for our animals possible. And that means that not only are animals getting sustainable seafood, they're also getting restaurant quality seafood. So the seafood that you get dining out at your favorite seafood restaurant 
is the same seafood that we serve to our otters, beluga whales, Pacific white-sided dolphins, California sea lions, on and on and on. And what's interesting about that is that you may, you may balk a little bit whenever you go look at a menu and see uh, the price tag associated with your favorite filet of halibut. Um, and indeed, sometimes um, our very large and hungry collection of animals here make a very big impact in terms of the tonnage and the dollars that are used to help ensure they have the best seafood and the most sustainable seafood possible. So one example of this is our lovely otter collection. Our otters are just fabulous, fuzzy, and some of our guests' absolute favorites. Um, and these guys eat a variety of seafood, including capelin, pollock, shrimp, clams, squid, mussels, crab, and krill. But what's funny about these guys is that otters pretty much always eat. And I know otter experts, but every time I walk down there, they're certainly chowing down on something. And our largest otter, Yaku, eats uh, 2.6 kilograms of clam, one kilogram of pollock, a half a kilogram of capelin, um, a fourth of a kilogram of squid, one and a half kilograms of shrimp every day. So this guy is chowing down. Um, and ultimately, he eats about 15% of his body weight on a daily basis. which is a ton of, which also, as you can imagine, is quite expensive because those are not cheap seafood items. Um, so Yaku alone on, an, on a yearly basis consumes 4,500 pounds of seafood. And our total otter collection goes through 25,000 pounds of frozen food each year. And that's funny because that's a, about the same thing, like the, the otter total is about the same as uh, for one of our beluga whales. So a very small animal compared to a very large animal eats a ton of food. And so why does all of this tonnage matter? So for, from Shed's perspective, because choosing sustainable seafood is an action that we can take as individuals and also on behalf of our animals, um, we know that it's critically important to share that story because when these when enormous, enormous amounts of seafood, it's imperative that we source the most sustainable seafood possible because we're having a very big impact on that wild fishery. So every single time our otters reach for a yummy piece of clam or an oyster or squid, et cetera, um, it's essentially having a direct impact on that fishery in the wild. So we want to be sure that our impact is positive in supporting sustainable, well-balanced fisheries. Another cool thing that we do to help sort of extend our conservation and sustainability mission to our animal food is reduce, reuse, and recycle. And that's not recycling paper or plastic or anything like that. It's helping to repurpose the seafood to different exhibits around the building. So our Pacific white-sided dolphins, our beluga whales, otters, and California sea lions um, have very significant needs when it comes to the amount of food, but also the quality of food that they eat every day. So our very dedicated marine mammal staff spends a lot of time sorting through the approximately 750 pounds of restaurant-quality seafood that are served to our animals on a daily basis. And because we have such high standards for what we serve our animals, a lot of those make the cut. They're either damaged in some way or during the unfreezing process just aren't exactly right for the animals in the oceanarium. But the super great news about that is, is that Shed, again, by sort of questioning assumptions and really looking into the nutritional and quality needs of our different animals, has determined that those fish that aren't exactly right for our um, marine mammals are exactly right and delicious for our sharks and rays. So we currently collect a lot of those fish that would otherwise have to be composted and then feed them in yummy morsels to our sharks and rays throughout the building. So it's just another way that we make sure that whatever we take, we, we use the most of it. So to sort of close this thought out, I just wanted to share one last message with why sustainable seafood matters. So as I mentioned, each one of us has the choices we make in terms of seafood. And this becomes more and more and more of a problem as our population grows. So by 2050, the world's population will reach 9.1 billion, which means food production must increase by 70% to sustain that population. So we need to produce an additional 20 million tons of animal protein. And that means far more fish are going to be needed to be able to sustain a healthy population of humans. And the problem is there aren't more fish in the ocean. You know, there aren't going to be a ton more fish that suddenly appear to help sustain this human need. On the contrary, we need to be very, very, very careful with the seafood that we do take from the wild to ensure that we're doing it sustainably as the demand for seafood 
remarkably increases over the next couple of years. And very, very lastly, to sort of drive that, drive that home, there, there is great hope when it comes to supplying sustainable and healthy protein for our growing population in that aquaculture, which oftentimes gives a fairly bad rap, um, I think somewhat unfairly, can be part of the solution. You know, as I mentioned, there's not going to be more fish in the ocean, but if we continue to eat sustainably harvested fish from the wild and we continue to support sustainable aquaculture, we could we could make a very big dent in that protein demand from fish. And that's largely because it takes fewer pounds um, of feed to grow fish than any other animal protein. Cattle, pigs, chickens even require significant, significantly more food to be able to grow one pound of that protein that humans can then enjoy. So sustainable seafood and sustainable aquaculture are a big part of what it will take to feed our growing population moving forward, and that's important to Shedd Aquarium as well. So very last, um, I will just mention that part of what Shedd does to support sustainable seafood is work with our more than 2 million guests annually and our significant reach when it comes to social media and the media to help folks to help empower folks to make sustainable seafood choices for themselves and for their family. And this message is really, you know, Shed, Shed works very hard to ensure that everything that we do on sustainable seafood is, um, is something that you can model and join us at home. And one easy way to do that is by downloading the Seafood Watch app. For those of you that use it, it's a very, very easy and concise way to look up, to look up the seafood that you're hoping to enjoy and identify whether or not it's sustainable. And so it's a really great, easy tool that you can use on the fly. Um, and so we recommend that folks do that. I also recommend and challenge you to think about um, your sustainable seafood consumption in terms of seasonality. A lot of people completely understand that agricultural crops, terrestrial crops, um, have seasons in which they're the best or the, or the most readily available. But folks typically don't have as great of an understanding about seasonality when it comes to seafood, but seasonality is equally important to aquatic ecosystems as it is terrestrial. So eating seasonally can make a big difference. Um, I also urge you not to forget about these lovely inland seas that sit um, on Shed's lovely backyard here. The Great Lakes are a very abundant, at this point, source of sustainable seafood. Shed, Shed commissioned um, Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch partnered with the University of Michigan to assess the sustainability of the top five um, Great Lakes commercial fisheries last year, and those actually turned out to be, to be very surprising in terms of how well that they were doing. Um, the top five fisheries achieved good alternative or best choice, um, best choice sustainability rankings from that study, so we can feel very good about eating locally as well. So to, to close today, I just want to say, you know, that Shed, Shed really takes sustainability very seriously when it comes to helping sustain our natural resources for future generations, to preserving and protecting the wildlife and wild places that share our home, be that in our own backyard here in the Great Lakes or globally. And we ensure that that mission is, is acted out on a daily basis here at the aquarium in the way that we care, care for our animals, in the way that we work with our guests. And we strive on a daily basis to ensure that we're walking the talk and helping to reduce our overall environmental footprint. And hopefully by 2018, with that sustainability strategic plans um, goals come to fruition, that we can look back at a five-year period of significant change and innovation here to reduce our environmental footprint as an aquarium and beyond. Thank you so much. And I'd love to take your questions at this time. Okay. Thank you very much very much. Very interesting talk. I'll see if we have questions here in our audience. Does anyone here have a question? Just a moment. Great. Nice talk. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, what was the capital investment for the water saving, pro, um, water saving section of your talk? That's a great question. You know, I would need to go back and crunch numbers on that. We did it over a, a number of years, so the capital is um, is definitely something that would I would need to crunch numbers for you, but it was significant. We had intended to be very deliberate about the capital investments that we underwent to be able to ensure that we achieved maximum um, sustainable sustainable return on investment with that. But I can I can happily dig dig a little bit and find that number for you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I had a question. What were the top five uh, fish? in the Great Lakes that, that are being uh, used for food in the Great Lakes area? 
Yeah, it's um, Lake Whitefish, um, Yellow Perch, Rainbow Smelt, Walleye, and uh, Lake Trout, primary fisheries that were assessed here. And we, and we decided to do those specific fisheries by surveying Canadian and American fisheries agencies and identifying what the total volume of catch was per species. So those were the, the folks that had, or the, the fish species that had the largest catch. Mm -hmm. And where do you get most of your um, seafood to feed your animals? Is some of that from local fish, or is it more um, from other areas? Great question. It, it's honestly from a variety of sources. So we have a specific gallery here at Shed dedicated to our local water, so they're local and Great Lakes species. So we do source some local seafood um, for, for those animals, but the majority of our seafood here at Shed is marine because many of our animals, uh, most of our animals are marine indeed, so they require um, ocean fish primarily. Okay, um, let me see if we have another question here. We have one online at this moment. Does the oceanarium use chlorine, UV, or ozone? If so, wouldn't that kill the microbes in the microbiome? That is a great question. I would need to do some digging into that as well. I, I know that we use the reverse osmosis system in our freshwater habitat upstairs, but I am not certain of what's exactly utilized in our oceanarium. But I will tell you that. Um, and I will look that up for you. Um, but I will tell you that part of the microbiome study that's currently going on is looking specifically at the oceanarium and identifying what microbes are there and how they're interacting with our animals. So I, I can reassure you that what we're using to, um, to make sure that our, our water is clean and healthy for our animals is will be investigated underneath that larger context to ensure that the microbes there are, um, the good microbes are, are kept for sure. That's a great question, though. There's another, another question online. How does the shed's water reduction compare to other aquariums? That's another great one. So the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, to which shed the report where a lot of its members self-report on their water reduction, water reduction initiatives, et cetera. I will say that there are many zoos and aquariums uh, among the AZA contingent that are doing absolutely remarkable things when it comes to sustainability. Um, and so I, I think that I, I can't speak for other institutions specifically, but I know that the zoo and aquarium com community is taking water reduction and energy reduction very seriously. And each, each particular institution has very specific needs. So um, I think that you know, we're, as a community, we're really striving to share best practices and help everyone reduce as much as they possibly can. But I think it's 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 we're, we're doing a lot as an industry for sure. Um, I had another question, and so you mentioned uh, the aquariums are conserving water and energy. Do you know how much energy savings you had with the water savings that you had over the last five years? Certainly. So so we. I don't have numbers specifically for you when it comes to the energy that was also saved at the same projects that were saving water, but we have a very um, we have a very active energy reduction plan as well. We have a master energy roadmap here at Shed that extends through 2020. That's going to help us hopefully um, truly get to a place where we're helping to generate and reuse energy as much as much. Well. Um, some of the microbiome work is going to have a significant impact on energy because it will sort of dictate how often we filter and replace the, the water through our, uh, through our specific habitats. So one example of that is the mangrove habitat in our wild reef exhibit, which contains bamboo sharks and lots of other great critters that are from that specific region. Um, as, a, as a, one of the earliest stages of the microbiome investigation here at SHED and an inquiry into best practices related to our energy use, we worked with our animal care staff to identify any opportunity for savings in that exhibit because we show because in the wild reef it showed to be a very significant user of energy. And through those investigations, our animal care team determined that we could significantly reduce the number of times that habitat was filtered, so using a lot of energy and a lot of water, um, and ultimately have no impact on the water quality health and standards for our animals. And that resulted in a 45% reduction in energy in that exhibit alone. So what we're trying to do right now 
is apply that same kind of question to as many exhibits around SHED as possible in, co in collaboration with this microbiome project to be able to save significant energy and water um, while maximizing, if not improving, water quality for our animals. Great. Um, I'll see if there's any other questions online. No? I guess I had one more then. <clears throat> so you mentioned, oh, and then we have a question in the front. Okay. Um, you mentioned doing do all the analyses with your staff there, or do you have other expertise out of the Shed Aquarium? So we have a laboratory and dedicated staff that works specifically on water quality here at Shed. So we undergo daily assessments of water quality in every exhibit, um, and that team is specifically dedicated to ensuring that those standards are upheld and that we're constantly making sure that you know our habitats are as healthy as possible. So we have this internal system and expertise that we utilize, but we're constantly sharing information and asking for input and expertise from our zoo and aquarium colleagues as well. Um, as well as our partners through, especially the microbiome project, for example. Um, so we're, we're, we're having others with expertise scrutinize our data as well to ensure that all of the conclusions that we draw um, not only are accurate, but they also can then be extended as best practice to um, our industry. Okay, we have uh, another question here. Chuck Curtis, I'm from the Institutional Water Treatment Program, and we uh, recommend water treatment and energy savings for cooling towers, boilers, closed systems, those kinds of uh, heating and cooling systems. And I wondered, uh, you mentioned cooling towers. I didn't know if you had any other kind of boilers or other kind of HVAC water systems. That's a great question. I honestly don't know the, the whole answer to that. The, our, our facility is incredibly complex. Um, I, will just, I will admit my ignorance to a certain extent to oversee the overall strategic execution of our sustainability programs, but I significantly rely upon the ex to be able to do that. And unfortunately, our, um, our vice president of facilities is, is getting his hip replaced, so he is not um, available to help answer some of these specific questions for you guys. Um, but I can absolutely look that up. I know that um, as a part of our energy roadmap and our water plan, um, we've been trying to maximize um, our, our overall footprint and our, um, and our system as much as possible. So certainly I, I know we have HVAC systems that I'm not certain if, um, I, I don't believe we have boilers, but I will definitely ask and make sure because that's obviously, as, as you rightly pointed out, a big part of this picture as well. Any other questions here? Oh, we have one, one more question. Hi, John Scott, penguin enthusiast. Uh, I'm just curious, so you said you switched from your species of penguins. What happened mm -hmm. to the saltwater? Uh, you said you switched species of peng penguins, correct? Yes. What happened to the uh, saltwater species? Where so did we they go? currently have with us. Um, so we have Magellanic and Rockhopper penguins. Um, so the freshwater species, uh, I'm not sure what happened to the specific animals, but most of the time what, what happens when Exhibit, exhibits change in a zoo and aquarium setting or, um, you know, our animal needs change. We, we work within the zoo and aquarium community, within the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and our sister institutions to ensure that those animals are transferred to another facility that has the appropriate care and space for those animals. So um, I'm not certain where those specific individuals went, but, that's, but that relationship and those communications um, between zoo and aquarium facilities under AZA are ongoing. Okay, well, thank you very much for your talk today and answering our questions, and we'll hope to all get up to the Shed Aquarium soon to look at your exhibit. So with that, I'll conclude today's seminar. We hope to see everyone or have you online uh, December 3rd for our next seminar. Thank you.